Well, hello everyone. So it's the time for this first uh, one of the best poster uh, awardee presenters. So based on your votes, uh, Flora uh, got one of the prizes for the best poster. So she will have a chance now to talk uh, the same work for 20 minutes. So Flora Charboni. <laughs> She's a PhD student at the University of Oxford, and she's going to talk about multi-agent reinforcement learning for the coordination of residual energy flexibility. So, Laura, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for the interest and for giving me the opportunity to speak about my research. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Start with the timer. Okay. So, um, I'll be presenting some, some of my PhD research looking at um, coordinating the residential energy flexibility and particularly I'm looking at the problem of scaling up algorithms for privacy preserving coordination of residential energy flexibility. So um, today, okay, this is a short presentation, we'll see how much of that I actually cover, but I'll first explain what the objectives of my research are then what are some of the challenges for the coordination of uh, flexibility in people's homes, um, what the landscapes of different options for coordinating distributed energy units uh, is, and which one I selected to my research, and then we'll go into the case study of um, my PhD, uh, which local energy systems I experimented, uh, what reinforcement learning methodology I've selected, and the results I've obtained. So, uh, the main primary overarching objective is um, decarbonization of society. So we know we need to limit global warming by 1.5 degree before uh, industrial levels. Looking at energy, energy is three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions. So it seems like a good place to start. Um, and in order to decarbonize energy, we, need, we know we need to do two things. Firstly, uh, decarbonizing power systems, but that's only part of the story because um, Electricity is only a fifth of our final energy consumption, so we also need to electrify everything. Uh, we shouldn't just have zero carbon electricity if we're still uh, burning oil for SUVs and burning gas to heat our homes. So we're trying to have decarbonized electricity and as well as electrifying heat and transport. Uh, now we know that's very challenging because renewable energy, we could need 70 to 85% of renewable energy, for example, in the power systems, and that's intermittent, so in order to integrated, we need some flexibility on the demand side. Um, and the residential sector seems like it's a high potential area for flexibility that we could use uh, for the demand side response. Uh, so for example, if we look at UK numbers, at the moment, the residential sector is 40% of electricity. But once we also electrify heat and transport, at the moment, that's over half of our energy consumption is UK, is for the residential sector. And particularly, we need most flexibility around peak time, and the residential sector is very focused around the peak, so there's very high potential there. If we don't coordinate what happens and, and everyone hit their homes and charges their car at the same time, we could have very adverse effects uh, in the grid. Um, but so far, the residential sector doesn't really participate in the on-site response markets, and there are good reasons for that. It's quite uh, challenging. So let's see if we can manage to coordinate that flexibility at scale um, and how. So there are three main reasons why it's challenging to coordinate residential energy flexibility. The first one is costs. Despite that huge potential in the residential sector, it's broken down into millions of homes. So any individual home, most of the time actually has quite low value. So it's not worth going into every home one by one and spending hundreds and hundreds of pounds on ICT infrastructure to have the fanciest mode of uh, communication and control infrastructure for low value. The second one is around acceptability and privacy. Uh, people won't accept interference into their daily lives. People won't want to be called at certain hours of the day or have to limit their trips and they will want to maintain their privacy so not share all their personal data centrally necessarily. And the third main challenge is around computational feasibility. Um, you may be able to run a convex optimization to run all assets in a microgrid, but if you have millions of homes, that you know that um, optimization time increases uh, with an exponential time, so it's not scalable. Also here, we, not, might not, we might not be able to have a, a convex representation of such a complex system, and we know we have a problem of partial 
information because we're trying to maintain privacy into people's homes. We can't access data about everyone all the time. So then the question for my PhD becomes a, a bit of a more complicated one is how can we design algorithms to coordinate residential energy flexibility at scale whilst also being cost effective and whilst also being privacy preserving and whilst also only having partial observability of a stochastic environment. Okay, so if we look generally at uh, distributed energy resources coordination, we can look like at a landscape of um, possible options. Um, so the first question we might want to ask ourselves is are we going to coordinate units directly or are they going to maintain some level of independence in decision making? So direct control uh, is the case where you, uh, all units give up all their information and control to a central entity that can directly manage everything and that's great for microgrids once again or some context in which the operator owns all the resources but for all the aforementioned challenges that might not be uh, feasible for our problem. So then in the indirect control mode we say that the decision making for the operation of assets is decentralized to some extent. Um, so then the second question we could ask ourselves is what is the structure of information sharing between um, distributed energy units? So you might have all units sharing information um, to a central entity and like we saw with um, this morning's talk that, that, that helps propagating information very efficiently. So you can do like auction mechanisms where you have a central mediator or you can do this optimize, iterative optimization with the help of a mediator that redistributes terms to each unit. Um, or you might do uh, bilateral coordination where information is shared um, information is shared only between peers um, and for each of these different structures you can have competition or cooperation um, but we know that in the case of the information sharing there are privacy issues security issues and cost issues especially as I said for modern homes so if we look at the case of implicit coordination can we manage to have some level of coordination between an distributed energy resources even without sharing information um, implicit competition is the case where every unit only does uh, their own local decision making only to minimize their own costs and that's very much the status quo, that's what everyone does today, everyone tries to um, only care about their own home when they schedule consumption to try and minimize their costs and maximize their comfort. Um, now we know that's going to cause problems in the network if everyone is uncoordinated with their massive electrical loads at the same time in, in low voltage network. So the area I'm, um, I've chosen to explore in my PhD is of implicit cooperation, where we're going to see if we can exploit the privacy and cost benefits of avoiding communication while avoiding some of the pitfalls of like selfish uh, implicit competitions that would cause problems and see if we can have units cooperate together but whilst removing the need for uh, communication of their personal information. Um, okay, so this is now um, in the context of my PhD, the model I'm experimenting with. So I'm taking a setup where I've got some agents that are um, under a substation. So each agent here will be a home. So it's agent in a certain sense of reinforcement learning agent of game um, theory, but here it just represents a home and each home might have a PD panel, might have some uh, household demand, um, some of which is inflexible and some of which is flexible. So you might have some flexibility with your dishwasher or washing machine or fridges. Um, I'm assuming homes can also have heat pumps that are used, um, they use electricity and there's some level of inertia in the home. That means that you, you can have some level of flexibility around the timings of heating um, whilst maintaining comfort. And then I have an electric car, which is sometimes at home, sometimes not at home. Uh, it's not always um, available. And here what's interesting is that each home is not trying to minimize their own costs only, but trying to minimize all these costs, the sum of these three costs for the whole system. So we're trying to minimize grid costs, and that includes the price of importing energy for the whole uh, group of homes as well as this coefficient here includes the price of 
um, the externality of emitting greenhouse gases for society, uh, depending on the carbon intensity of the electricity at a given time. And we're also trying to minimize grid losses, so we don't want everyone importing or exporting at the same time, uh, which is why there's second order dependency on G, which is the, the grid imports. We're also trying to uh, disincentivize congestion of the distribution network by adding um, a cost on exporting so that we're incentivizing uh, prosumers to use the flexibility within their home first and then if beneficial use the, the distribution network and we're trying to manage the degradation of each home's batteries in their um, electric cars. Um, so now, um, so far, the problem of implicit um, cooperation has only been explored a little bit. So most of, most of people would only look at like drop control, so managing frequency in a decentralized way, um, using local information, and then some uh, reinforcement learning, some multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning in the cooperative setting has been explored. But so far, scalability had been limited to at most maybe eight agents and not really in context where we had um, electric vehicles and the detailed description of heating and so on. Um, and because the scalability with uh, traditional methods has so far been limited, here I'm trying to experiment with different variations on the standard uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, okay, so thankfully this should have already been covered, what is reinforcement learning? So we're trying to have uh, agents, in this case homes, trying to learn through experimentation what the best uh, set of like local control decisions should be based on the, on the state. And here I'm focusing on a simple reinforcement learning methodology, which is Q-learning, to focus on the coordination problem between reinforcement learning agents. Um, so from, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, so we know Q-learning has a problem with uh, the curse of dimensionality, which some of you might have heard, which means that for large action and state spaces, it becomes really hard to explore sufficiently and get uh, satisfactory policies. So here, uh, even though we have a, a set of sub-actions at the home level in terms of uh, car charging and consumption and heating, I've simplified this to a single um, action for the reinforcement learning uh, that can then be uh, broken down into sub-actions, um, so at the local level. Um, so, these are the main methodological experiments that I've performed in my PhD. Um, so, starting from the standard Q-learning update rule, which allows you to iteratively update what your estimate of the value of a given action at a given time is, I've explored some variations. Firstly, you could either do distributed reinforcement um, independent Q-learning, in which case each agent learns from their own experience only and can uh, learn their own individual policy. Or you can do centralized, still independent Q-learning, in which case a single policy is learned using everyone's experience and then everyone uses the same policy. Another key innovation here is that traditionally um, reinforcement learning agents learn from exploring the environment semi-randomly and then trying to converge to a good policy. Um, but as we'll see in the results, that doesn't provide good coordination at scale. So here we're introducing learning from omniscient optimizations, meaning that instead of learning from random explorations, we're observing what an omniscient perfect optimizer would do, and we're learning from that. Um, so you couldn't actually run convex optimizations in real life, because in real life you can't have perfect knowledge of all current and future variables, uh, and perfect forecasts, and control of everyone's assets. But during training, we're in a safe simulation environment, and we can cheat and, and pretend we can have this uh, godlike god -like omniscient optimizer we can learn from. Um, and the third methodological variation is around the reward definition. So traditionally, each agent would get the total reward, this one, which corresponds to the total objective, uh, total global objective function as a feedback for how good their action were. 
but the problem if you have multiple agents, so this, this was, um, this methodology was developed for one agent, but when you apply that to multiple agents, it becomes really hard for them to interpret that global re reward because they don't know um, how much their individual action contributed to the global value. You might have a particularly good reward thanks to the stochasticity of envi the environment. It was a particularly sunny day. Or you might have a really good reward because other agents have been smart even though you did something that was not good. So here, there are different variations to try and single out um, individual contributions to global value. And the main one I'll focus on is the marginal reward where you perform additional baselining simulations so that you can send to each agent uh, the difference between the global reward had they followed their reinforcement learning policy minus the global reward if they had just been default passive inflexible agents. So you're keep sending them individuals, individualized feedback. Um, just checking how I'm doing with time. Okay. Um, so these are the results, as I said, they were different uh, methodological variations, but here I'm just going to focus on the two main ones that I think um, are most interesting. So first let me explain what this figure shows. Um, so on the left hand side I'm showing you what learning from uh, one home, one agent looks like. So and then here you can see on the x-axis is the number of learning epochs, so each, at each epoch uh, agents can explore the environment or get uh, explorations from the optimizer and then learn from that experience. And then at the next step, we, then we perform the evaluation step that we plot here and then we explore, learn, evaluate. So that's one, one epoch. And on the Y axis, um, I'm showing you the savings that are obtained for the coalition as opposed to the baseline in which all agents were just passive, inflexible, um, so no delay of consumption. Um, here you can see that at the start, all policies just take random actions while they're exploring because they have no knowledge yet. And that's why you have a, it costs you way more for the group to just do random things rather than just being passive. And then gradually learning from experience, they can converge to better results. So that's the one prosumer. And then on the right hand side, I'm showing you the final rewards after policies have been learned, how well we're doing depending on the number of prosumers. So you can see for one agent, my standard multi-agent reinforcement learning does really well. So the standard one is the orange one, where we're just giving agents the total reward um, learning from random explorations. But that methodology was designed for one agent. So as you scale, you get worse and worse results until you obtain results that are actually worse than the baseline. So you might as well not do anything smart because you're doing things worse. Um, and there are three main reasons for that. So here we're doing independent Q-learning in a stochastic environment but with only partial observability, as I mentioned earlier. So um, there's a problem of like Pareto selection. You've got each agent trying to experiment and improve on their policy, but they're not aligning between themselves. They're not sharing any insight into how they fit into one another. So agents might get stuck in local minima where they're unable to find what the globally optimal policy would be because other agents are not within that globally optimal uh, space of, of potential policies. So that's the power to selection problem. You also have the problem of stochasticity of the environment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, agents are unable to differentiate between what the actions of other agents are, particularly when agents are exploring, versus what is due to the stochasticity of the environment, versus what is due to their own action. Um, and the third problem, well, one of the <laughs> Three of some of the problems is that of non-stationarity of the environment. So in um, reinforcement learning, the theory is based around Markov decision processes. And you assume that the, even if you have a stochastic environment, the underlying dynamics of the environment are uh, stationary. Um, and that you can learn a policy given the dynamics of an environment that you're exploring. But here, because all agents are learning and updating their policies as you learn, they impact the dynamics of the environment because their probabilities of taking different actions changes with time. Um, so that's why that doesn't work. And now we can see that the novel algorithm, which learns from this omniscient optimizer during the pre-learning in simulations, 
and which uses the marginal rewards that can give individual feedback to agents, can scale. So uh, not only maintains good performance, but also the, var the variation actually reduces as you increase the number of agents. Um, so that's the main results for uh, this step within the phenomenal learning. Um, and we're pretty happy with that. Now there still are limitations, of course. Um, the main one being that even though we've um, removed the need for expensive computations during exp um, implementation, because now during implementation, agents can just directly apply the policy without any computation or communication, the learning is still uh, computationally expensive. Let me check again how much time I have. No, okay. I'm not going to tell you about next steps then because I'm running out of time. But now I'm working on um, other multi-agent reinforcement learning um, strategies to try and uh, still find an equilibrium mechanism, like the optimizer acted as an equilibrium mechanism for all these uh, concurrently learning agents, but trying to remove the need for these optimizations, which uh, do limit scalability during learning, as it's computationally expensive to run lots of optimizations to generate the training data. Um, and, well, I will just, whoops, I will just give you a, a small insight into um, what I'm doing, which is so far we've been doing independent Q-learning, in which if you imagine this is a Q-table, and in real life it often isn't a, just a Q-table, it's neural networks, but it's easier to visualize as Q-tables. You have each agent learning their own policies without having a global view of the system, which causes the problems I had mentioned. The opposite would be to learn a centralized value estimator, so learning all possible combinations of state and actions for all the agents and trying to understand the value, but it's really hard to explore that whole space and doesn't scale. And then the option I'm now investigating is that of learning a value network for each agent, as well as learning a mixing network of how they can be combined into a global value estimator that you can then pro propagate back uh, to the agents for learning. Um, and that could be another way of providing um, mechanism for equilibrium selection without optimizations. Um, yes, so as I said, the main three hurdles I was trying to overcome for residential energy flexibility coordination were that of costs, so minimal, we here we've managed to um, only need minimal communication infrastructure for implementation, that of acceptability, so here we are removing the need for sharing personal data and interference into daily lives, and uh, in terms of computations, since we're using a statistical approach, all the computations are during training and there are no more computations to do during um, implementation. Great, I think we still have some time for questions. Um, so feel free to ask. So the only, at most, you have one-way communication. So here I assume uh, homes do receive price signals. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the UK, there's this uh, company called Octopus that had an agile tariff where they do give you 24 hours ahead of time what the half hourly prices for the next day would be. Uh, but you can receive that uh, market signal, but you wouldn't communicate your personal data outside of the home. Mm. So what kind of cost difference we're talking about? want to buy directional communication? Um, so that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, the prices of smart meters can vary country to country. So first, I'd um, like to say, of course, optimizations with perfect uh, communication would be better. Mm -hmm. And actually, I didn't mention earlier, but that line here is what you'd have if you had a perfect uh, omniscient optimizer that had, as I said, perfect access to all current and future variables and could control everything. So that gap here, you can see obviously optimizers provide you more value and that gap can be interpreted. In, so this is perfect omniscient uh, knowledge and this is only partial observability of the stochastic environment. And that gap can be interpreted as like the value of information. So it's always a trade-off between, um, between the cost of that infrastructure, both in terms of installation costs, smart meter costs, and also um, trust with the, the consumers, are they happy to share the data? Um, 
but here we are trying to find a niche where we're saying there are lots of low value homes that for, for which it wouldn't be worth investing this time and, and money and who wouldn't necessarily have acceptability for the sharing of data. It's not as good as perfectly optimizing them in real time, but we couldn't do that at the scale of a country anyway. So if perfect central optimization is not feasible, here's what we can do without. Um, and in lots of cases, I think in 40% in of cases, when people try and smart, uh, install smart meters into people's home, it fails because each home is different. Each home has problems. There's um, lots of trials fail because of interoperability between devices and different homes with different devices. So it is uh, not only the, the cost of the hardware, but also the cost of installation, the cost of operation, and the, yeah. Yeah, sure. So here, because um, each agent only looks at their own uh, environment, you can s all the other agents can become part of this stochastic environment. So from the point of view of any given agent, there is no difference between the stochastic environment. So is it sunny today? What are the prices of energy? Uh, and the behavior of the other agents, so their consumption patterns, their TV generation pattern, their, their driving patterns. So. Um, normally in reinforcement learning, even if there is some stochasticity, so it's not deterministic, the probability distributions of transitioning between one state to another and the probability distribution of um, rewards um, given state and action pairs should be stationary. But here, because all agents gradually learn their control policies, they actually, each agent is changing their probabilities of taking different actions at different times. Sorry. So from the point of view on one a of one agent, the dynamics of the environment are changing, even though that environment really is partly other agents. Does that make sense? Yeah. So could you do better than this? Yeah. That's what I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> um, so, so far with the, I'm, I'm sure you could. So, okay, part of the limitation of this approach is that um, on this paper, I, I used Q-learning, which is a very simplistic reinforcement learning approach. Mm -hmm. And I did that because I really wanted to isolate the problem of that, um, coordinating between agents at scale given one reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, but here, the set of, um, observations that each agent can take is quite limited. So they're only taking the grid price signal. Because every time I tried giving agents more information, Q-learning wouldn't learn as well. But I'm hoping that uh, using deep learning methods, so, because um, here you have two components where you have the reinforcement learning algorithm component, and then you have the, how do you coordinate all of these uh, agents component. And I'm hoping that by improving on the reinforcement learning algorithms, I would be able to feed more information to agents and also allow them to have more granularity in the way they select their actions. So hopefully they could do better than that. You will never meet the red because you have this, you have less information um, and you have less control. Um, but hopefully we can do a bit better than that. At the moment that corresponds to, I think 45 pound per month per consumer saving, um, not just in their energy bills, um, but also thanks to reduced greenhouse gas emissions, reduced uh, distribution network injection, uh, reduced grid uh, losses, and so on. Yeah. Any last question? Yeah. I have yeah, one. I want, yeah. So, as I if I understand correctly, your action is just a value between zero and one. Right? Yes. Do you have some uh, qualitative insights into what the perfect agent is doing versus what the yellow agent is doing? Yeah. Um, so, okay, it's interesting because, okay, here I only showed you the purple one, but actually the green one that you could probably can't see so well with the projector is also interesting to look at because depending on which policy you select, some are trying to do energy arbitrage. So like typically um, learning from the optimizer without this marginal reward, um, you would do a lot of arbitraging because the optimizer, because it acts with perfect knowledge of everything, knows exactly when to strike, when to import everything and when to export everything. So you tend to learn policies 
which uh, take advantage of the price differentials more, but then degrade the batteries more. Whereas the purple policy here tends to just smooth out the profile as much as possible and takes less advantage of the energy, sa um, energy cost savings opportunity, but limits battery degradation a lot more. Um, yeah, and what's quite interesting to see as well is if you just learn from the optimizer using the normal total rework policy, you're doing very poorly. And part of that is that because you can't just copy an entity that has perfect knowledge and control of everything and apply the same uh, confident <laughs> approach when you act in partial observability of a stochastic environment. So the best one is a lot more about smoothing out profiles. shaded regions, is that representing like all of the different um, like That's the, the 25th, right? so that's 25th percentile region and 75th okay, percentile. Because I did multiple uh, repetitions to take into account the, the effect of like seeds because there's like random variables involved. Yeah. Right. So like given, um, I think maybe it was like 10 different, so I have 10 different repetitions and here and have, so there's probably 100 different runs with different data generated and this is the the variation of results you get. Yeah. Cool. Very nice. Thank you so much for that.